This here is another viewer's broken gaming PC. And uh, you're gonna find this story interesting. Apparently the owner was gaming, editing documents, just doing what you normally do with computers, right? He connected an ethernet cable. I guess he was moving stuff around. And the moment he connected it, it cut to a blue screen. And then power shut off. He turned it back on and he couldn't get a signal to his monitor. And that's how it's been ever since. Never heard that one before. My first thought was to check inside the RJ45 port itself, surrounding type A ports. Everything in each of these looks super fine and no crossed or shorted or missing pins. Could this be coincidence then? Is there perhaps more to the story or did plugging in the ethernet cable actually create some sort of issue that we may run into in this video? I have no idea, but we'll find out together. I hope you will stay with me. Starforge systems, like the one you're seeing here, come in all shapes, sizes, prices, and themes. Customize the PC that best suits you and let the experts at Starforge take it from there. Builds feature premium quality components, no different than what you or I might use in a custom build, and the attention to detail is excellent. Each Starforge PC is hand-built in Austin, Texas, and ships with a full two-year parts and labor warranty. They sport tasteful cable management, option swappable plate lights in their Voyager lineup, which I'm a huge fan of here, and some of the coolest licenses themes on the market, if I do say so myself, including Terraria, Dragonlight, and even old school RuneScape. If only these rigs actually improved my mouse skills, which, uh, yeah, are quite lacking. Nothing quite like Borkoth staring at me from inside my PC while it absolutely destroys me in game. There's something sick and twisted about that. Look, the truth is there are tons of builds, themes, and components to choose from at StarForgeSystems.com, including the latest and greatest graphics cards. So be sure to click the link below and pay them a visit today. Hello there and welcome to Fix or Flop. My name's Greg, I am overdue for a haircut. And in this playlist, we attempt to fix broken computers in and around the Orlando, Florida area for free. So we don't charge for hardware, or labor, and that's thanks to your viewerships. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. If you or someone you know has a broken computer, like a chance to have it fixed for free in this series, be sure to submit a form linked in this video's description. On to this one then. What on earth are we getting ourselves into? Never have I ever heard of an ethernet cable killing a system. She is a bit on the older side, X470 motherboard, 5600G, and an RX 5700 XT. There's an EVGA 650 watt power supply down here, and everything is housed inside this older Thermaltake chassis. I honestly wish I had more to tell you about this before we dive into the troubleshooting. I, I just, I feel like there should be more context here, but <laughs> you can see from the description, the owner was very direct, very upfront about what he saw, what he was doing when the incident occurred. I don't think it was was anything he did himself. It was just maybe bad timing, bad luck, who really knows? So let's try powering this thing on for a baseline. Recall the stated symptom is no picture out. So I do expect this will at least power on. And there we are, it does. Looks like all the fans are spinning. Yeah, on this side of things, all seems well. But on this side of things, uh, yeah, whole lot of nothing. Now, thankfully, this board has debug LEDs, and the one illuminated currently is for the CPU. That is not good. I've cleared the CMOS via this button here, and also tried manually jumping pins, but we still get the same light. And for those curious, the manual pins to jump are right here next to this full-length slot, JBAT1. I'm curious what we're dealing with behind the motherboard tray, if maybe we have some sort of cable that's been disconnected, this power supply is modular, but at first glance, everything seems pretty normal back here. This here is the A-pin EPS cable. Everything seems fine, at least on the board side. And you can see it's fully inserted on the power supply side, as is every other cable. I normally wouldn't jump this fast into testing the power supply, but I'd rather know this is okay before we jump into the motherboard and that more labor intensive thing. So let's go ahead and power it on. And yep, no beeping. That's always a good sign. We are a pass, it seems, across the board. So power supply is okay. I also doubt this will change anything, but since we have an APU installed, I wanna remove the discrete card and see if we have any hope of a picture out without it in there. Again, I highly doubt this will actually fix anything. I just wanna rule out the possibility of some conflict in the BIOS defaulting video out through the APU and not the 5700 XT. Sometimes you get weird conflicts there. So it does power right back up. We've got our HDMI cable connected to the motherboard now for integrated graphics. And I will say, 
my initial impressions. Uh, yep, yeah, looks like we're in the same spot we were in before. Alrighty. I think this motherboard's coming out. And just to recap how we got here, you know, uh, it, it's always good to retrace your steps. We've been doing this for almost six full seasons now, which is incredible. Thank you again so much for the support. I never thought we'd have this many episodes of just a, a random playlist I had kind of thought of in the middle of COVID. This system had its CMOS cleared, we had its power supply tested, and we had its graphics card removed with no change of state to the symptom. The CPU debug LED was still illuminated. It still is currently, the system's on right now, and uh, yeah, th th nothing has changed about it, which tells me that all of those other things we've tested are not the cause. In, in saying what I've just said though, this is I guess proof, uh, <laughs> proof of what I just w was preaching on camera here. The, the CPU and the motherboard are the two things I've been suspecting, but I haven't actually tested DRAM yet. And I've made that mistake in the past where I've just completely overlooked DRAM and that ended up being the issue. I doubt it's the issue here because the debug LED is not for DRAM, it's for CPU, but debug LEDs have been wrong before. We've seen that as well on this playlist, so don't always take those as gospel. Let's quickly reseat DRAM. We'll try a single known working stick from my own stash as well before we actually remove the motherboard. Wow, really glad I, I film this, I would have completely forgot. First things first, we'll need to remove this front CPU cooler fan. This is blocking three of the four dims. I think the innermost will be able to remove without taking the cooler off. I'd prefer not to have to take the cooler off if I don't need to. So that's why, again, it's good to check this beforehand. If I can get this, there, there we go, unclipped. Actually, I think I can remove all four. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna take all four out and just test the system as is without DRAM installed at all. This will typically throw a DRAM code as you'd expect, but if the CPU light is still illuminated, that will tell me that the board hasn't gone far enough through its post process to even check if DRAM exists. Now, since I have a known working DIM with which to test, that will make what you're about to see a bit redundant. Why not just pop this in? If it doesn't post, then we know it's probably not RAM related. But for those who don't have replacement DIMs just sitting around waiting for troubleshooting, it can actually be useful to just remove DRAM to see if the exact same symptom persists. If it does, then you know it's probably not your DRAM. So here we go, a test with no system RAM installed. What will happen? Yep, okay, right away, same thing as before. The CPU debug light is still on. So like I said, of course, we aren't going to get a post without memory installed, but since the exact same symptom persists, I think we are safe to assume that DRAM is not to blame. But just to prove the point, I'll go ahead and insert my known working DIM. I know a lot of this is, sounds redundant. It sounds like I'm repeating myself. I'm just trying to show you that you don't have to have a bunch of hardware on hand to effectively troubleshoot. This isn't totally foolproof, but it will definitely point you in the right direction. I'm gonna say nine, 9.5 times out of 10. I'm gonna look really stupid here if not. And what do you know? CPU debug light is still illuminated. See, I didn't necessarily need a, a known working dim in order to rule out what I already have here. It's kind of a uh, archaic way of doing it, but it's cost effective, so there's that. Place your bets then. How many of you think the CPU will be to blame versus how many of you think the motherboard will be? And I suppose there's also an option for both. I uh, really hope it's not both. Let's check CMOS battery voltage at 3.1. We are healthy here. Just put this back where I got it. We definitely could have checked this without removing the motherboard. It just uh, occurred to me when I had it out of the case. We'll go ahead and jerk this cooler off. All cleaned up now. Would you look at this beauty? The owner's Ryzen 5 5600G. And at first glance, everything here on the backside looks to be intact. No bent or missing pins. You get a really good perspective of that by holding the chips sideways and looking down each alley. The socket also looks Looks great, save some spillover isopropyl alcohol that will evaporate in a few seconds. So since we don't see any obvious physical damage on either component, it's sort of a toss up. Whichever one you can more easily replace is probably the route I would go. If you have a spare CPU laying around, uh, that would do it. But since the description from the owner mentioned an ethernet cable, 
being plugged into the motherboard, I am inclined to swap the motherboard. I think the odds of this being bad are greater since something was connected to this around the time the system died. X470 should be an easy one to replace. Let's try one of these brand new B550s. I bought a bunch of these boards a few months ago for occasions just like this. And while this chipset is not identical to his X470, I would typically regard newer B550 boards as more desirable. They usually have most of the same features without the annoying chipset fans. This particular SKU is also great because it natively supports 5000 series chips, although a 5600G might be an exception. I'll have to double check. But even if it doesn't natively, these all support QFlash Plus, which I made sure of before I bought them. This will make upgrading BIOSes super easy if you don't have a compatible CPU already on hand. And so after swapping over his 5600G kit of DRAM and his two M.2s, I will admit I was a bit overzealous here. We didn't have to connect all of this. In fact, we're going to have to undo all of it if the motherboard ends up working just fine and his CPU ends up being the culprit. We've got uh, a, a bit of a cluster here and I just want to describe what you're looking at. So we have a fan sitting here just to visualize the system being on because otherwise you wouldn't really be able to tell. Uh, and I don't have a cooler attached because the system's not going to be on that long. I just want to try for a post and we're going to be running off of integrated graphics. His discrete card is just kind of chilling for now. That also reminds me we should probably connect the HDMI cable. And uh, let's go ahead and try jumping the power pins. That'll be these two right here. All right, so things look good so far. You can see this fan spinning. And uh, I'm just gonna be checking CPU temps here. So it is getting hot, which is a good sign. I think this will do the trick. I think his board died somehow when that ethernet cable was attached. Yeah, it's, it's, it's receiving power. Will we get a post? Come on, post. Was I wrong then? Do we actually have a dead CPU? Well, it's warming up. It's doing what it's supposed to. It's just not, it's not sending a picture out. Maybe this board's not compatible natively with this chip. Oh, no, there we go. Okay, I was gonna say, I started second guessing myself. That is a post and that's really all we need to see before this gets too hot, I'm gonna power this back off. And uh, yeah, this pretty much looks like a slam dunk motherboard swap. But a bit of a sanity check, we can't technically draw any conclusions just yet because we don't know if there's just some sort of weird funky incompatibility between that APU and this original board. This is an X470 board, I mean, it's a second gen Ryzen era of chipsets. And so I'm going to pair this with a known working Ryzen 7 1700X. First gen CPU, this is I think an eight core, 16 thread chip, right? Uh, it should work natively with this board regardless of the BIOS revision. And even if there is a BIOS out there that strips first gen support for this board, we can also toss in one of my working Ryzen 5 3600s to cover all of our bases. I don't think there's any BIOS that would strip both 3600 and 1700 support for really any like uh, X3, X4, X570 motherboard out there. The, the BIOSes can get very finicky with these because Sometimes they have to remove support for certain chips in order to add support for others. These BIOS chips don't have a ton of storage on them. And so uh, that's what ends up happening. Usually you lose support for like first gen APUs, like the 2400G and the like. Sometimes first gen Ryzen as well, if you're going with a very, very late BIOS revision. But uh, I think we'll be covered here. If we cannot get a post with either this CPU or my 3600, then this thing is as good as dead. And of course, since we aren't using an APU, we'll need to connect discrete graphics for picture out. Also, I'm not worried about this board potentially killing the CPU in here because, well, it probably would have done that already with the 5600G, the original CPU from the owner, and we've confirmed that that works already. So uh, risk is fairly low, but if I lose a 1700X, big whoop, I don't use it much anyway. It's more for testing at this point. So it's powered on. I don't have the fan connected to show you, but there are LEDs on this side of the board. Curious if this chip gets hot. Oh wow, so it is. So the CPU is being fed power, which is usually what we don't see when a board is dead. But will we get a picture out? I do not think so. I went ahead and threw a cooler on just to let it last a bit longer and still nothing on screen. Let's try once more with a Ryzen 5 3600. So newer CPU, this will rule out a BIOS incompatibility. This chip is also getting hot, albeit not as quickly because it's a lower core count, more efficient chip. But I'm not expecting much to come of this either. This does not feel like a BIOS incompatibility because again, why would it all of a sudden stop working with a 5600G and then also not work with a 1700X and then <laughs> at, this, at this point here also not work with a 3600? We've tried pretty much 
every relevant CPU for this board under the sun, or at least generationally, and we still have nothing. The chip does get hot, it is receiving power, but there is something else about this board that does not want to play ball. You can see from this thermal chem here, this one chip next to rear IO is heating up exceptionally, hotter than even VRM MOSFETs around the CPU socket. I went and looked this up. It's an Asmedia ASM1142 in charge of controlling USB 3.1 ports. There are two, I believe, on this board, and they're very close to this chip, which makes sense, though they aren't attached to the Ethernet cable or the Ethernet port as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it may be as a coincidence that they are in close proximity to each other even though they aren't necessarily in the same housing. You can see though that all of these USB ports look to be sound. There aren't any crossed or shorted pins, so it might just come down to having to re-solder a replacement chip. The problem is I don't have a donor board with this replacement chip on hand. If I ordered one, it would take several days. And frankly, my soldering skills aren't that great. So for the sake of time management on my own side, I'd rather just replace the board, which is exactly what we're gonna do here. With the CPU cooler migrated over, we can slowly lower it back into his chassis, tighten down a few Phillips screws, and spend a few minutes on cable management. It was uh, looking pretty rough before, so well, tackle this. Only a few minutes later and after installing the graphics card and its supplemental PCIe cables as well, we arrive here in a uh, much better state, if you ask me, than where we started. I'm not sure if partly, uh, the, you know, the cabling and stuff was the way it was because the owner was troubleshooting on his own. I don't know if he has a lot of parts on hand to, to troubleshoot with, but uh, the overall state of the rig, I think, is, is better now than it was before. Maybe we'll take it outside and give it a quick dusting. But apart from that, we are ready to power back on for the last time, hopefully, I think it will post and we can send it on its way back to its owner. So things have lit up. We've got fans spinning up front. Looks like the blower and the card is also spinning. And we've got our HDMI cable connected to the discrete card just to, uh, to try to get picture out through it. I think before we were running off of integrated graphics. So uh, this will be another way to check the card ensure that that is working correctly. Come on. Oh, all right, there we go. Whew. I was hoping it wasn't just gonna boot loop to infinity. That is a huge relief. I believe Windows is also loaded on one of these two M.2s in here. So uh, I'm gonna tab through this and try to load into Windows just to be on the safe side. After resetting TPM and a few reboots later, which makes sense, again, we replaced the board. So there will be a few driver discrepancies that uh, hopefully Windows will take care of during startup. We arrive at the sweet, sweet smell of the home screen. It is such a relief to see picture again, a working system all around. The OS looks good. Everything loads very quickly. All the fans are spinning. Nothing's too loud. We'll go in and enable DOCP just to get the, the RAM and stuff in check. I don't think he was doing any manual overclocking, but that is a possibility with this combination. Whew. I'm so glad we were able to pull this one off. You know, sometimes things happen that we cannot explain. I definitely cannot fully explain what the owner experienced, I kind of wish I was there because uh, I've never heard of an RJ45 port or just something being connected to it, killing the board in question. But uh, well, that would make for just yet another random, just crazy story that uh, we can add to the Fix or Flop playlist. I am just shocked that we have seen so many different issues. Now, one of my fears starting this series way back again in like 2020, 2021, was that this would get redundant very quickly because I mean, we'd inevitably see similar issues, symptoms and fixes over and over, right? And I know at the end of the day, it was a motherboard swap and we've done many of those, but the symptoms and the causes and just the, the, the things we have to tackle in between are always very different, it feels like. And of course, the hardware is always very different, which makes for an exciting one on my end as well. So while I wish I could tell you more about why this board decided to kick the can, I think the more important thing at the end of the day is that his system is back up and running, which is always my goal. And I know some folks say, well, Greg, all you did was swap a part. You didn't really fix it. You just replaced a broken one. That often, my friends, is what is required to fix something. I would do the same if it was a car or any other mechanical electronic thing out there. Sometimes it's more cost-effective, more economical to just replace the faulty thing, which is what we did here. It actually has, in my opinion, a better board at the end of the day. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to give it a thumbs up. That would be greatly appreciated. Subscribe if you haven't already, folks. That's a huge help for us, that red button down below. And uh, consider checking out our new channel, Salazar's Cars, for some automotive fun. My name's Greg. Thanks for learning with me.